Okay, well good afternoon everybody and uh, welcome to the Sockany stand and uh, well we're on a countdown now. It's uh, three o'clock in the afternoon and I've got a couple of real experts with me to, to give you a few last minute top tips I hope. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Britain's leading entrant in the men's race for tomorrow, Johnny Pepper, uh, GB International. So uh, Johnny, uh, welcome and we're, we're here from you in just a second and on my right I'm delighted to be joined by Mike Gratton, former winner of the London Marathon as well, uh, as well as a Commonwealth Games bronze medalist. So, a bit of a treat for you, and uh, we're going to ask both of these guys for, for a few of their thoughts on, on how to run the race. Obviously, they run it pretty quickly, but they're going to give you tips on, on how to do it at whatever speed you're running at. Now, Johnny, I'll bring you in first of all. Um, you're running tomorrow, and uh, what, sort of, what sort of time are you hoping to run tomorrow if it goes well? Uh, well, I'm looking to go uh, as close to 2.15 as I can, really. Um, it, I've only run one marathon before, but my, uh, my training sort of indicates that I could go around there, so that'd be great. Now, you, you've got a little bit of pacing help, uh, I know, been set up for you, and um, conditions look okay, so training's gone well, you're up for it. Yeah, like I said, training's gone really well. Um, I've, uh, I've had a lot better build-up than last year. Um, I'm fairly, pretty inexperienced really, I've only done one marathon, um, so I'm learning every, every time I, I, I go out the door really to do all those long runs. Um, but uh, yeah, the, I mean, it's, at this point you just have to trust the work you've done and I think when I look back I'm, I'm pretty confident that it's there and it's in the bag and I've just got to go out and see how it goes. Now you're, you're not that inexperienced as a runner, unfortunately I do remember you've been on young athlete camps I took 12 years ago which is quite worrying for me and uh, I know you've run for Great Britain as a junior on the cross country and on the track as well but it's a step up to the marathon uh, for the second time for you isn't it so, so good luck and we'll come back to you Mike, um, very different, lots of experience, um, 2.09 to win the marathon at London which is obviously the famous time that's on your shirt as well. Uh, what were the sort of the things that went through your mind in the final 24 hours and the build up to the race normally? Um, it's a strange position be between being confident and sort of doubtful as well. So I'd run 2.12 in the Commonwealth Games um, just six months before. So, and that was on a tough course and behind Robert Di Costello who at the time had run 2.8. So I thought sub 2.10 was on, but at the same time you're kind of taking a big risk to go out at that speed. So there was a kind of should I do it, should I not do it kind of attitude. In the end, you just go for it because you don't make improvements unless you take some kind of risk. And on the day it happened, it was great. I was a 2.9.43 uh, and uh, yeah, my big win under Mountain. Let's, let's quickly talk training. Um, let's get a little bit geeky because it's fun to do that for people like me. Johnny, sort of, what sort of training have you been doing? How many miles a week have you kind of peaked at throughout this period of marathon prep? Uh, well, my, my peak... Uh, has been just a shade over 100 miles a week so um, in marathon terms that's not actually as, as large as you might expect um, but I'm, I'm 24 so I've, I'm relatively young in marathon terms so um, plenty of time to build that up just have to kind of emphasize consistency really over peak weeks because it's easy to run one big week but harder to run lots of big weeks and, and what have been the key types of training that you've done? I'm assuming you've had long runs in there, maybe some tempo running, some sessions. What sort of things do you put in your training to make that 100 miles a week count? Um, well, really, I just like to... I like to try not to jog. Really try and make every run a good run. And if I feel like I can't, can't run properly with the right kind of... Um, the right form and everything, then it's probably best to rest. But, uh, yeah, I... I I do a lot of steady running and try and get in good sort of 10k shape maybe two months out of the marathon and then put all the long runs in in the kind of the month following that and try and work up to sort of a, a, a 23, 24 mile run um, at a very good pace, very close to what, what I would be running for the marathon really. Okay, Mike, in the 1980s, we, we kind of ruled the world, at least we thought we did in distance running. You were one of the tough men of the sport. How many miles a week were you running? Um, it peaked at around 140 miles a week, but uh, in the year 1982-83, a 12 months period, I ran an average of 118 miles for the whole, whole year. So um, most weeks were 125-ish, peak week 140. If I was resting up, say, for the national cross country, maybe about 100 miles a week. Never below 100 miles a week. 
Mike used to be nine foot tall. You can see he's gradually worn himself down. Um, what were the key things you used to do within that week? Um, key session, obviously, for the marathon was the long run. So on a Sunday, I'd run 22 miles in the morning, then in the afternoon, go and run another five miles so that you're always close to the marathon distance. It's not feasible, really, to go and run the marathon distance regularly, but breaking up in one day, you can actually cover the marathon distance. Uh, you know, obviously, with the background training I had, I wouldn't suggest it to, to most people. Uh, and then second to that, I was coming from a track background, I was an English schools champion at 5,000 5, metres, so I, I knew a lot about interval running, and I did a lot of intervals, 25 times 400, with very short recoveries, and used that to build up the basic speed I needed to run sub 500 miles for 26 miles. Uh, so those two things combined, I think, were the key. And then the rest of the training was really just hard miles, and, and uh, you know, no jogging, there's no point in going for a jog, you're not going to get any training from that. So most of the training was at a good tempo, always trying to run reasonably quickly, although not flat out every session. There's people breaking into sweat just hearing this. Um, we've very much got the, the young sort of up and coming end of the sport, Mike's experience here. Johnny, you're being very sensible, 100 miles a week, you're going to build up to more than that, I know, I'm sure, in the years ahead. Um, what sort of training have you done that's really told you you're ready, though, to run well tomorrow? Um, it's, a, it's the long runs, always the long runs that tell you the most, I'd say. So, one long run I did, that I'd pick out probably a 38k run, uh, it's probably one of the longest I did, and that was about 325 per kilometre, which I how it worked out, but it was, a, it was a good run, one of the best I've done, and so it really gave me confidence and strength there, so um, just whether I can just run a little bit quicker for a little bit longer tomorrow. <laughs> I'm hoping, and I'm sure you can. And Mike, what would have been the key, perhaps, indicator for you? Um, again, the long runs. Um, when you get into the last four or five weeks, and the long runs just gradually get faster. And usually, we, I train with a group, which included Nick Braun, a 211 marathon runner, uh, Martin Knapp, a 217 marathon runner. And my last long run, which was a, a 22 mile run, uh, in the second half of that run, I just ran away from those two guys who were really you know, struggling to stay with the pace. So you come off that training run thinking, yeah, I'm definitely in shape. And races obviously help a little bit, but usually when you're racing, you're racing tired if you're doing all those miles. So I would never run a really fast half marathon, maybe you know, 64, 64 and a half minutes, which at the speed I would do a half marathon during the marathon. So racing was a good indicator, but really the long runs, the last three or four long runs, if they go really well, then you know you're in good shape. I just want to relay this to everybody here. You've all done long runs and they will have gone well. One or two probably won't have gone as well. That doesn't matter because you remember the ones that have gone well. And whatever you've done, whatever your speed's been, you take that with you tomorrow and you believe in yourselves and you trust yourselves. So don't worry about the speeds you're hearing here. Listen to what they're saying about the confidence they got from the long runs they actually did. Now, we're going to get two different answers next. Nutrition strategy here. What, what do you do for your breakfast um, on race day? And what do you then do for your nutrition? nutrition strategy during the race, Johnny? Um, just simple foods for breakfast, um, banana, uh, I'll have a toasted bagel with honey and a bowl of cereal maybe, depending on how hungry I am, but nothing, nothing heavy. And during the race I'll just take on uh, fluids when I feel like I can stomach them because in my last marathon I kind of forced them down and it gave me a bit of stomach trouble. So. Um, probably in the first half I'll try and take three drinks, which would be like an electrolyte and, um, uh, and an energy kind of mix, quite light still though. Now, you've got to take this one with a pinch of salt. Mike, what happened to you in the London Marathon in terms of drinks and gels? Um, well, there were no gels, there's no such thing as gels in 1983. Um, it was a rainy day and I didn't feel I needed to drink at all during the race, so I did the whole race without drinking a drop of water. So, not recommended. And other marathons I've done, like the Commonwealth Games in Brisbane, Australia, which was hot, I drank at every drink station. Um, but you can run a marathon um, at, at two hour speed, two hour ten speed, without drinking because you're not out there for too long. Certainly, gels we had in some races, maybe cold tea with sugar on a drink station which was kind of the electrolyte drink of the of the time or in sort of south african type races that they would use defiz coca-cola not diet coke because that's not got any sugar in it but uh, just normal coke defiz and the drink stations and you take a mouthful of that and that's the equivalent of a, a gatorade or, or whatever so not really the equivalent but that's what we had just to rescue this bit in terms of what's available nowadays and i know you would you would do it differently would, would you take gels on 
Definitely. I don't think I've changed my drinking strategy because we've gone through a generation when they kept saying drink, 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 and that's turned out to be bad advice actually with hyponatremia. So um, you should drink to thirst. So if it's a hot day and you're thirsty, we'll drink. And if it's a cold day and you're not thirsty, then don't drink as much. I mean, I'd still say do some drinking. Um, but the gel thing is quite important because um, for the first time you know, in, the, in the last few years, you're able to take on board energy um, which you, you weren't able to do before. And the gels are a very compact way of taking the energy on board. In the past, you'd have to eat rice pudding on the run or a banana, and it's very difficult to stomach that. And ultra runners still do that. But now you can take on a gel, and that will give you energy within a few minutes of, of taking it. So it's a technology, I think, which has come along and has actually moved the sport forward. Other technologies have been a slow kind of in, improvement in running shoes and things. But the one big thing which has really helped people, it's a pretty slower runner who's going to be out there for five hours, is the ability to take on energy during the run, which we couldn't do before. Fantastic. Johnny, have you got any top tips for these guys tomorrow? Any, any sort of nuggets that you can share, either from all the coaching you've had over the years or the experiences you've had with, with the training and, and the marathon you've done? Um, it's kind of tough because whatever advice I give, I kind of have to take it myself as well, really. So um, I'd probably say trust the training you've done and uh, be tough at, in the last 10K. Yep, I'd agree. You've certainly got to go to battle in the last 10k. Mike, any top tips from you? Yeah, I think the critical thing in running a marathon is to get the pace right. Um, and if you run too fast at the start, it doesn't matter how many gels you take, you're going to hit the wall at 15 to 18 miles and be walking and jogging for the last six miles. So the important thing is it's not so much even pace, but even effort. You're going to be fresh at the start, so run a little bit quicker at the start, but not substantially. And maybe be maybe a minute or two minutes ahead of your schedule. Um, in my terms, I ran through in the London Marathon in 64.11 at halfway, 65.30 in the second half, so I didn't slow down very much, but fatigue was there. Um, so try and get the balance of your running so that you're running comfortably in the first half, not straining yourself, um, but expect a bit of fatigue in the end. If you try and get time under your belt and run 10 minutes or 15 minutes quicker in the first half, you'll explode and you'll end up walking at the end. So pace judgment, particularly in the first 15 miles, is the absolute critical part of the race. Mike, thank you. Johnny, any other things you're going to do later this year? Any other plans apart from obviously recover from tomorrow? I'll decide uh, about lunchtime tomorrow. Um, and yeah, if I don't run another marathon, I'd probably, I'd probably try and um, get my times down over shorter distances like 10k and do a bit of cross country in the winter and come back again this time next year for a spring marathon. Definitely something to take from that, uh, guys. Uh, when you recover from tomorrow, go back to maybe doing some shorter stuff, some faster stuff if you're interested in your running before you do another marathon. Mike, I know these days you're very busy. 209 is on your shirt. What does that mean? Um, it's, it's a, we run a travel and, and training company and uh, oh, about 30 years ago now we, we started doing training camps in Portugal uh, and then we started creating events and also taking people to events like the New York Marathon. So I still get to go out, um, I ran a half marathon in Marrakesh in January and a, another half marathon in Barcelona in February. So I can still live the high life through my travel company and go and do some races. My next big race will be the Great Wall of China in, my, in May and then the Swiss Alpine 30 kilometres in July. So. Uh, if, if you want to travel to an exotic marathon, then that's what we do. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Johnny. We wish Johnny the best of luck tomorrow, obviously, all of us. And uh, thank you, and uh, good luck to yourself and Sockany. Mike, thank you very much for sparing the time this afternoon. And above all else, good luck to everybody else here. Well done, guys.